Hi everyone and welcome to a lesson or our first lesson on a whole bunch of lessons on probability. This one's basically a recap lesson on sample space and probability. Now I don't know about you but our oh, stats wasn't my favorite. Really wasn't. Uh, at school, just to let you know, uh, my maths teacher for two whole years just gave us the textbook, list of questions, and actually said, off you go, teach yourself. We had no direct instruction whatsoever, which sort of explains why I hate stats with a passion. But the good news is, the stuff we're going to deal with today is really, really easy. On the screen behind me, you will see a huge list of things that we're theoretically going to cover. I'm not going to read them all, but sample spaces, random experiments, tree diagrams, and, and, and all of that stuff. Now, once we know what the language means, then theoretically speaking, see what I did there? Theoretically speaking, against experimentally, anyway, uh, we should be able to ace this whole uh, module on probability. So let's kick straight in with sample space and events. All right? As I say here, when you roll a die, and no, I don't want you to die, a die is a singular for a dice, although apparently the rules have changed and we may be back to die again so let's just stick with die when I roll a die I pretty much can describe everything that I need to in probability so when I roll it once and I see what comes out <laughs> well, then I get my outcome so I roll it once oh look I've got a six whoop 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 um, so a six is an outcome when we get to this thing called a sample space, a sample space is basically just a list of all the different outcomes now when I roll a die a standard die numbered one to six I'm probably not gonna get a seven at least I hope I'm not going to get a 7, otherwise that's gone something really wrong with my die. But the sample space here, as I say, has gotten a little e, and that's really important. That's uh, the elements of, that's, that describes everything that's possible, is equal to these squiggly lines. Now, they're supposed to be beautiful brackets, but I, who can draw those? And then a comma-separated list of all the different outcomes. Now, if you don't put those squiggly lines in, sadly, you're wrong. All right? It's so important that you get your notation right. An event. Well, an event is a description for a collection of outcomes. So when I roll my die, I may be looking for the event, for example, um, rolling an even number. So in that situation, I would write PR. Now, I know I've got a P there, but I'd probably write PR even, yeah? Anywhere you see a P in this sheet, please read that as PR. A random experiment is pretty well much one, as I say there, that can't be predicted. Yes, so I don't think at this moment in time, if I was to roll a die, I'd have any idea what the outcome is. So it's fairly random. Then we get on to our next little section, which are Venn diagrams. I hated these at school. I had no idea what they were talking about. And I remember teaching my first school in Australia, and I'd already taught for 20 years, and managed to avoid stats for that whole time. And having to sit there and try and teach my very first group um, Venn diagrams, and my little mind was exploding because I thought, oh, this is going to be so hard, and actually couldn't be further from the truth. So the first thing's first, a Venn diagram has to have a box around it. And ideally, it should have that little E up in the top-hand corner. Now, again, I work with a guy who used to get very, very upset if kids didn't do that little E. Textbooks are inconsistent. I'm just going to go with what I believe is correct. And then to describe each event, we draw a circle. So as I've got here, I've got two events. PRA, which is the uh, probability of rolling an even number, and we're dealing with the diet, and PRB, the probability of rolling a number greater than four. So I'm going to put an A here beside that circle and a B there. Now, everything inside the circle is basically an outcome. And so if I was looking at rolling an even number, I know that the even numbers are two, four, and six. Now, before you start screaming at me, wait, 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 wait. And then we got rolling a number greater than four is B. So a number greater than four is five and six. Now, what do you notice? Well, actually, two of those outcomes are shared between A and B. And the great thing is here, we can now put that in the middle of that little section there, that, that overlap, or as we're about to call it, an intersection. And that's pretty much it for Venn diagrams. Yes? Well, not quite. What do you notice is missing? Is that all of the outcomes? No. The number one is missing, as is the number three. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, here, inside my Venn diagram, have all my different events. Uh, sorry, have all my different outcomes. See, I'm at it now. And as such, I could find loads of probabilities. The language is really important. So, union is basically all of the outcomes that are contained within the two events. It's given by the symbol U. I couldn't get my little computer to do that. And if I was going to do a Venn diagram, circle, circle, 
assuming there's an overlap and there's not always an overlap in, that would be basically all of those events added together. Intersection, all right? Now, when you have a parking intersection, it's where places meet. So basically, it's where things are shared. It has the symbol N, and I know lower down in the school you were taught and, but mm, be careful. And if we were going to have a Venn diagram describe that situation, it would effectively be that little color bit in there. Now, mutually exclusive, as I just said a moment ago, not all events will have an overlap. So for example, if I had the probability of A being an odd number and the probability of B being an even number, then they will never overlap. And as such, they're called mutually exclusive. And if we were to describe that with two Venn diagrams, uh, two Venn diagrams even, there wouldn't be an overlap. So again, language is, being, is, is important. And this union and this intersection and mutually exclusive become much more important as we go through. Now, the addition rule for probability, I think, is freaking awesome. Right? It's used ever such a lot, and it's best described using a Venn diagram. So I'm going to draw a Venn diagram. Uh, I'm going to have two events that do overlap, and we're going to call those A, and we're going to call them B. Now, what if I wanted to find the probability of A or B happening. We're looking for the probability of A or B, or A union B. Now, if you remember, I don't really want to color in my, my, my diagram, so I'm going to color in another one here. The union is basically all of this here. So we're looking at the union of A and B. So obviously, I want to do the probability of A. Oh, let's put the A back in there. And I'm looking for, to add that, the probability of B. But we have a small problem. When I add A and B together, then sadly, I'm going to end up with a number greater than 1. Can you see why? Well, it actually turns out that we end up double counting that middle bit there. If an, if an event happens in both A and happens in B, we need to make sure that we only single count it. And the way we do that is we actually take away one probability, and that is one overlap. Do you see how that works? I think it's flipping awesome. Now, this formula here is used ever, ever such a lot. So basically, whenever a question says it wants me to find A union B or A or B, as I say, then I the only thing I know for this particular course is to use this formula here, the additional prob probability. Now, there is a little bit of a, you know, sort of but to all of this. And that's where events are mutually exclusive. If they're mutually exclusive, what do you know about the PR of A and B? Well, because there's no overlap, there is in fact zero. And so in that situation where two events are mutually exclusive, it becomes the probability of A plus the probability of B. We don't have to take over the overlap or don't have to take away the overlap because there's no overlap to take away. Oh, tree diagrams. Freaking awesome, I have to say. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are over here in Australia doing methods three and four, you have to just thank Yucky Stars now that you don't have to do Markov chains. Hate, 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 hate. They've gone. So basically, a tree diagram is nothing more than a visual representation of the probabilities which might take place in an experiment. For example, if we look at coins being tossed, I always say, well, this is my start. Now, there's no need for you to write start. I'm just being visual. When I actually toss my coin, I end up with how many outcomes? Two, absolutely. Two outcomes, a head or a tail. And so for each outcome, I'm going to draw a effective branch. Now, because I know the probabilities for a coin, assuming it is not a biased coin, i.e. it's fair, are a half and a half. So now that is effectively one toss of my coin, but I now get another toss. Sound effects. Yeah, no, too much. And again, my coin, just because it's landed on head or tail, it doesn't suddenly grow another outcome. There is still two outcomes, so it's a head and a tail and a head and a tail. My probabilities are the same. And lo and behold, we have our tree diagram, which now expresses the outcomes for two coin tosses. At this point here, I have the probability of a head followed by a head. Here I have a probability of a head followed by a tail, probability of a tail followed by a head, and the probability of a tail followed by a tail, which, if we were going to work out the individual probabilities of that, is a half times a half, and a half times a half, <laughs> this is thrilling, and a half times a half, and a half times a half, which is one quarter, one to one quarter, one to one quarter, 
1.1 quarter. Now, the good thing is, when we add all of these things together, what do we happen to find? Yes, well, a quarter plus a quarter plus a quarter plus a quarter gives me one, and that's what we would expect from our tree diagram. Because your tree diagram should be showing all possible outcomes. Now, there's much, much more coming up on tree diagrams soon, um, particularly in the next lesson uh, where we deal with conditional probability. But get to like tree diagrams. They're really, really awesome. As you see, the next section says finding probabilities for equally likely outcomes. Now, this is really year seven maths. And as I say here, it's vital to note the following formula only applies if there are equally likely outcomes. So, for example, what is the probability of getting a six on the roll of one dice? It's one over six. Why? Because there is one six out of six different outcomes. I really don't want to go too deeply into that because it's a little bit dull. Okay, compliments and compliments. Um, very few people, ladies and gentlemen, pay me compliments uh, because it says there it's a polite expression of praise or admiration. And unfortunately, as a teacher, we get very little praise and quite a lot of not praise. I don't know what the opposite to that one is. But compliment uh, is slightly different with a compliment. So and the best way I can explain this is if I know the probability that it is going to rain today is 0 0.6, the probability that it is not going to rain today is equal to 0 0.4. So the complement to the probability that it rains is basically 1 minus the probability it rains. Yep, remember that probabilities have to add up to 1. And for an instance where there are two outcomes, either it's raining or it's not raining, it's nice and easy. You just take one away from, uh, well, one, actually. We can formulize this. We love our little formulas in mathematics. We call P R A dashed. Now, this little dashed means the complement. Alternatively, you probably noticed I wrote the word rain and put a line over it. Both of those, as far as I'm concerned, are equally acceptable. Subjective probabilities, wow. I'm looking out of the window at this moment in time. Behind my camera is actually a window of a beautiful garden scene. I'm looking out there and going, oh, I wonder what the probability is going to rain is. And I literally go, mm, uh, mm, I don't know what the lick in the finger is, but apparently it helps with wind direction. But the point of it is, if I was to turn around and say, oh, it looks like a 0.1% chance of rain, that's a subjective probability. I'm literally making it up. I have absolutely no scientific or experimental basis for creating that value of 0.1. I'm just looking out, I don't see a cloud, and it seems really steadily sunny at this moment in time. So just be careful with the language with regard to subjective probabilities. A more accurate way, as I say here, is taking some sort of empirical data. Now, I don't work for the Med Office, thankfully, because it rains and I don't want to spend all day talking about the weather. Apparently, being British, that's what I'm supposed to do anyway, but nah, not true. A more accurate way would be to do some sort of mathematical or statistical survey where as I build up more and more data, I can become more and more, um, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, precise or accurate with regards to my outcome. Now, where there's a dodgy one here, but if I was to throw a coin 10 times, uh, would it become 50% of landing on a head? Probably not. I mean, I don't know, give it a go. Uh, I'll wait for you. Uh, yes, you back here? Okay, cool. Um, if I throw it a thousand times, the chances are my probabilities will get closer and closer to a half. Oh, probabilities from areas. Love, 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 love. Now, trying to find the probability of getting a bullseye on a dart is actually a question I've seen loads and loads in an exam. But areas can provide you probabilities. So to take it slightly easier, if I had this here, as my shaded area against a huge white piece of paper, for example, and I was trying to throw a dart at it, wouldn't it be great if I could find a graphics to throw a dart? Um, then what I need to do is to find the probability I'm looking at finding the area of the shaded section, because that's the probability of success. I want to hit that shaded section divided by the area of the whole shape, including the, sh uh, the shaded section. So finding the area of this section here and having that on the bottom and then multiply by 100 or whatever I need to do will actually give me my probabilities. Areas are great and, and there are a number of questions if you're using the Cambridge Essentials textbook that'll help you do that. Carlo maps, again, I, I love Carlo maps. Again, when, oh, when I saw Venn diagrams, I was like, no, not Venn diagrams. And then I got to these Carlo maps or probability tables and I'm like, no, no more. I can't do this too hard. But again, Carlo maps are 
awesome. And if you get the understanding of a Carnot map, and I think I'm gonna do another video on Carnot maps. But long story short, Carnot maps, and thank you very much to Cambridge for allowing me to use these diagrams. Um, and in fact, the next question, Cambridge Essential textbooks are just are awesome. Uh, a Carnot map is nothing more than a table created from a Venn diagram. So if you notice your Venn diagram here, you've got probability A and probability of B, and then we've got A, and the complement of A, or A not happening, B, and the complement of B, B not happening. And then each of the sections relates to one of the four areas of a Carnot map. There's one area, two areas, three areas, and we can't forget the area outside as well. So here is an example of a Carnot map, and this is where I'm pretty much going to end the video. It's been a long one. But uh, Simone visits the dentist once every six months for a checkup. All right, good on you, Simone. Well done, good teeth, love your gnashes. The probability that she will need her teeth cleaned is 0.35. The probability she will need a filling is 0.1. And the probability she'll need both is 0.05. So before I go any further, I'm gonna draw myself a Carnot map. Now, what do we have? We've got cleaned and filling. So cleaned and not cleaned, and then filling and not filling. Now notice the way I set up my Carnot map. It doesn't matter whether you had filling and not filling and clean and not clean, but you don't want to mix things up by clean and filling and not clean and not filling. All right? I don't think that works particularly well. Uh, sadly, I saw a teacher do that once and, and the lesson was a train wreck. So the probability she needs her teeth cleaned is 0.35. And it's always like, where do I put this value? Well, the probability she needs it clean, that's all clean. That means clean and filling or clean and not filling. So actually we put the 0.35 here. And the probability she needs a filling is 0.1. Now that's a filling or not a filling, you know? So she needs, a, sorry, a clean and a filling or a clean and not a filling. So that goes here as 0.1. Now the great thing is, remember, a Carnot map is just a Venn diagram and all of those probabilities have to add up to make one. So before I go any further, I know that has to be 0 0.9 and that has to be 0 0.65 because the numbers facing this way have to add up to one. And the numbers down here have to add up to one as well. So that's awesome. But I can't fill in the rest of my table without at least one more piece of information. And they always need to give me three decent pieces of information. And actually it turns out it's here. The probability that she'll need both. So she needs to have a clean and a filling is 0.05. Having got that information, I can automatically now fill those in because adding across here, they have to make 0.1. Adding down, that has to give me 0.30. This would have to give me 0.6. And the great news here is it doesn't matter whether I add my rows and columns, they all add up. So I've now got my Carnot map. And the question says, what is the probability that she will not need her teeth cleaned? but will need a filling. So not need a, a teeth clean and a filling. So all I need to now is look at not clean and filling, not clean and filling, which is this value here, and I can write that down as 0 0.05. The probability she will not need either of these, so not clean and not a filling, so not clean and not a filling, just look where those two things on the table map, and I get 0.6. I love Carnot maps. But, ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of this. Now, I, I'm going to stop saying this at some point, but I have a Patreon account. I'm very excited. And what's Patreon? It allows you to support me in creating these videos. If you can pop over there, the link is coming up on the screen now, and just have a look. I'd be great. And if you can't if you can't actually donate, then why not get out there and tell some people to come on over and subscribe to my YouTube channel? That would be just as supportive. Otherwise, if you are already on my YouTube channel, thank you very much. Why not? hit that button there and subscribe and uh, if not hey there's a video coming up over there as well that you can watch it's been good seeing you i look forward to seeing you next time have a great day bye bye